generational. Nothing personal. Word of the day, Monday, July 5th, 2021 is generational. Hope everyone had a good July 4th yesterday. Spent time with generations, family, friends, some fireworks. Hope there was no JPP situation. I think about that every July 4th. Imagine getting that call as team president. Generational. I'm talking about Shohei Otani, though. This weekend had some news with the All-Star Game. The All-Star Game in baseball is a pretty big deal. From an executive standpoint, the reason it's a big deal is that we keep track of the amount of money that we have to pay out to each player on our team who's named an All-Star because many contracts have bonus provisions depending on whether you are selected or elected. There are different amounts in almost every contract we gave to our players. Selected to the All-Star Game is when you are selected by the commissioner's office, by the players, by the managers. That is selected. Elected is when the fans elect you and you are a starter in the All-Star Game. We always wanted to give more money to players for bonuses who were elected because that means the Marlins are doing something right, both from a marketing standpoint, from a team standpoint. We have a popular player and there could be at least some possible economic benefit to having our guy starting. Selected is fine, but you can be the Orioles and have a player or the Marlins this year and have a player, meaning last place teams get a player because in baseball, everybody gets a trophy. It's a rule that I fought against for years. And I wanna tell you why I fought against it before we talk about Shohei. The rule in baseball is every single team gets a representative, no matter what. Even if your player is not an all-star. Even if you don't have one guy on your team who deserves to be an all-star, your team gets an all-star. The theory behind it is that you are going to watch the all-star game if you are the Marlins because Trevor Rogers is an all-star. On the hope that he pitches, on the thought that he comes in during the introductions when they line up and they on TV, you see every player, you see someone in a Marlins uniform this year, they won't be in a Marlins uniform because they're all going to be in separate uniforms this year for the first time in God knows how long, maybe forever. But the theory is more people will watch, more people will be engaged, more people will buy the all-star jerseys. Except on the other side, I think there can be a backlash, which is why is this guy an all-star? Oh, that's right, because he has to be. Do you think that player doesn't know? We had an example of that, a great a great guy, great guy, who I still am in touch with. His name is Gabby Sanchez, and I can't remember the year, Coca, but there was one year where Gabby Sanchez was the Marlins representative to the All-Star game. Uh, I'm blanking, because that's what happens on a random Monday morning following a two-day weekend. And we recognize that, he really did, didn't have an all-star year. 2011, thank you, Coca. But he made it. He got his bonus for being an all-star, and he was happy. I was happy for him because he gets to be an all-star player for the rest of his career. He is an all-star player, deserving because he's such a good guy. That particular year, he was simply the best of the worst because our team did not get off to a great start that year or, frankly, a great finish. So the way all-star teams are put together – Baseball is also very strange. Knowing that players get bonuses for being an all-star, a rule was put into place after the all-star game tie, way back in Milwaukee when Bud Selig was commissioner. I'm at that game watching tie game. Bud Selig shrugs his shoulders. Can't remember the year, Coca, but it was early in the 2000s. Can't remember what year it was, but doesn't matter. Bud Selig shrugs because they're out of pitchers and the game has to end in a tie. That was 2002. Thank you, Matt. And uh, Matt is on top of it this morning. He wanted the day off, but we said, no way, no days off. It's no holiday for us here. Nothing personal. It's a Monday, just another Monday. So after the tie, everything changed. They started with the this time it counts, where now the 
home field advantage for the World Series went to the winning team of the All-Star Game. So if the National League won the All-Star Game, that means the National League got to host the World Series games one, two, and six, seven. The World Series, you play two at home, go on the road for three, and then you play game six and seven at home. Unlike the NBA, which is two, two, one, 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 it's such a pain in the ass to get in and out of a baseball clubhouse that you don't schlep somewhere for one game and then leave and then come back and then leave. It's too much. So in baseball, in the uh, World Series, it's two, three, two. And that's for party purposes and for all the things that surround the World Series for broadcast purposes, yada, yada. In 2003, the American League won the All-Star Game. So the Yankees had home field advantage in the World Series against the Marlins. So we had to go to Yankee Stadium to win game six, which we did. And that was that. No big deal. Home field advantage, not as huge a deal in baseball. Fine. So this time it counts was a whole thing. But then because the game ended in a tie, the other rule change is that any pitchers who pitched on the Sunday before the Tuesday All-Star game, they were not going to pitch in the All-Star game. They were going to be replaced on the All-Star roster. So this year, as an example, the best pitcher in baseball, because of the way the calendar happens, Jacob DeGrom is going to pitch on Sunday, whatever Sunday is, July 11th. Thank you, Coca. Therefore, he is not available to pitch Tuesday's game, All-Star game, July 13th. Therefore, he is going to be replaced. Jacob DeGrom still gets counted as an All-Star. His replacement still gets counted as an All-Star. Mike Trout voted in by the fans. Congratulations, you're starting the All-Star game. Oh, no, you're not. You're hurt. Don't worry. We'll replace you. So instead of having 28 guys, American League, 28 in the National League, whatever the number is, sometimes there can be up to 35 or 38 or 39 All-Stars per team. It's as though no matter how good you are or how bad you are, you have a pretty good chance of being an All-Star so now take it a step further on the business side here in baseball. When you take a player to arbitration and you recall what that means by being a fan of nothing personal, that means you've been in the lead between three and six years. One of the arbitration criteria is something called special accomplishments. Did you win a Cy Young? Did you win an MVP? Did you win a World Series MVP, a League Championship Series MVP, a Gold Glove, a Silver Slugger? An all-star. That doesn't seem fair. The reason I wanted the rule changed is that players come into arbitration and they say, hey, guess what? I was an all-star for two years before I even hit arbitration. What it may not say is I was the lone representative for my team. What it may not say is I was an injury replacement because they needed a certain position, et cetera, et cetera. But it counts as being an all-star. So that's sort of the business side of the All-Star Game. What's the pleasure side? What pleasure do you get by watching the All-Star Game? Well, this year, you have a chance to watch, watch me land the plane, a generational All-Star. Shohei Otani is an All-Star as a designated hitter, voted in by the fans to be the starting designated hitter. And yesterday, he was named a pitcher on the American League team as well. So he is a pitcher and a hitter. I've never seen anything like it. I'm getting some shade thrown my way, but I want to be clear where I am in Otani. I love watching him. It's pretty cool, right? He can pitch, he can hit. He's a fine pitcher. I would in no way say he's an all-star pitcher, but he is certainly an all-star hitter this year, leading the league in home runs, 31 home runs, which is unbelievable, actually. He's pitching to a, he was pitching to a two and a half ERA, he got taken out in the first inning, his last start against the Yankees. And so I think his ERA is now in the threes. He walks too many guys, but it's still an amazing story. Joe Madden, his manager, has backed him completely, having spoken to Kevin Cash, who's going to manage the All-Stars. I got to do a side note, Coco, we didn't prep this, but I got to do it. Something is on my mind that is bothering me. And I read an article about Dave Martinez. Dave Martinez is the manager of the Nationals. Make sure you put a pin in where I was on Otani, please. Dave Martinez is the manager of the Washington Nationals. One of the great memories of beating the Cubs in 2003, 
shockingly, the first thing that came into my head when the last out was secured is that Jack McKeon and the rest of our coaches were going to be the manager and coaches of the next year's All-Star game. Because the rule is when you win a World Series or you're in the World Series, so all you have to do is win the pennant, you and your coaching staff go to next year's All-Star game. You are the manager. It's really quite cool. Dave Martinez was the World Series winning manager of the Washington Nationals in 2019, getting ready to manage the 2020 All-Star game. Uh Uh-oh, COVID. All-Star game canceled last year. Dave Martinez didn't get to manage. Wouldn't it make sense that Dave Martinez would manage this year's All-Star team? Nope. They've got Dave Roberts managing because the Dodgers won the World Series in that 60-game season of COVID. And so they just pretended the Nationals never won. Dave Roberts has already managed the All-Star game because the Dodgers were in the World Series under him several times already. Why couldn't baseball make the decision to allow Dave Martinez and his coaching staff to manage the World Series? Sometimes baseball is so stringent and set in their thinking that they're unwilling to view fairness. They're unwilling to say, wow, wouldn't it make perfect sense for Dave Martinez to manage the All-Star game? But no, Kevin Cash is the one who got the call from Joe Madden. That's American League National League, so that doesn't even match, but doesn't matter. Kevin Cash is from the race. It does match, actually, because if you're going to do Dave Martinez of the Nationals, you've got to do I guess you can't do A.J. Hinch, can you? Was it A.J. Hinch? All right, here we go, Coca. Work with me. Work with me. Did the Nationals beat the Astros in a game seven in 2019? Therefore, it would have been A.J. Hinch. Therefore, you could say it could be Dusty Baker. But I would say, no, no, let Kevin Cash do it against Dave Martinez. Why would that have been a problem? Anyway, Kevin Cash of the Rays is managing And so Joe Madden called him up and said, please, can you make sure Otani both pitches and hits? I would have our GM call the the GM of the team where the manager was. I would have our manager call the manager of the team. I'm sorry to tell you guys this. I never wanted our pitchers to pitch in the All-Star game. I wanted our hitters to get an at-bat. I wanted when our guy started, like one year we had Ozuna start. I wanted him to get two at-bats and then rest. All-star break is for resting. When you pitch, no matter what a pitcher tells you, I'm ready to go. It's my bullpen day. Everything's good. I'm not going to give it max effort. They're full of it. They're in the all-star game. Everyone's watching. They're pitching against their friends, the best of the best, sometimes not the best of the best. They are dialing it up, and they are trying to win the game. So I liked when pitchers were named all-stars. I just didn't like when they pitched. But Joe Madden is saying, hey, listen, this is a generational talent. It makes no sense to not have him hit and pitch. I agree. It's going to be fun. He's in the home run derby, too. Are you guys excited for the home run derby? In 2017, the home run derby was the best part of the all-star game that was hosted in Miami. We had Justin Bohr in it as a Marlin. That was the year that Aaron Judge crushed and won. He was simply terrific. There's something about home run derbies last year with Vladimir Guerrero was unbelievable. He's not even repeating because he wants to rest a little bit more. And I don't blame him for that. Uh, It's the most tired when I was flying, when I was with Giancarlo Stanton after he won the home run derby in 2016, we're on the plane flying back from San Diego world trophy in hand. And he is, and this is a guy who doesn't get tired. This is a guy who can go out and go out and hit home runs and do great. He said he's never been more physically tired or more sore from all the swings. So I get when players are saying, I don't want to do it. I always hesitate pressuring players to do the all-star game or the home run derby. This year, they've got a good story with Trey Mancini in the home run derby. They've got Salvador Perez, not sure why. Pete Alonso is a good one, but Shohei Otani is the star of the weekend in Colorado. I would look for Otani to win the home run derby. I would look for Otani to get the MVP of the all-star game by hitting a home run and pitching a scoreless inning. 
And then I would look for Otani to take some naps because he's going to be tired. Generational was the word of the day. You know, Coke and I spoke this weekend. We don't speak often during the weekends when stories come up. We'll text, maybe we'll talk, and then we'll get ready on Sunday for Monday's show. But I started giving you picks for each weekend day. And it's hard to do picks in advance because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But I want to go through the picks from this weekend and my view of what you did as a listener, what I did as a talker. Friday, we had the fills over the Padres. And they did. That's a win. Took them 10 innings, but they got there. Saturday, we had the Mets over the Yankees. I said Stroman's going to beat Cole. Now, funny enough, Stroman did beat Cole, but that was Sunday. But Saturday's game was still Mets-Yankees. And the Mets won. So that's a win. Sunday... I told you that the Nats would beat Trevor Bauer and the Dodgers because the distraction would be too great. Trevor Bauer did not pitch. Thank you for listening to the emergency pod. Coca, did as many people listen to the emergency 10 minutes on Bauer as the first 45 minutes on Friday? We did a show on Friday talking about what would happen with Trevor Bauer that he had to be put on administrative leave. And then right after we We did the show. He was put on administrative leave. So Coke and I got back on the air, did another 10 minutes on what that means, et cetera, because there was a lot of confusion in the world about Trevor Bauer being put on seven-day administrative leave and what it means. But I told you, wait to see. He's not going to pitch within seven days or even the next seven days or the next seven days. We didn't do an official wait to see on that extra pod. If you didn't listen to it, do, because it's quite a story. But Bueller. Uh, not Bueller, Bauer did not pitch Sunday. But guess what? The Dodgers beat the Nats. So I'm taking that as a loss. So during the weekend, we went two and one. We are now 92 and 67. Pick of the day for Monday. We got two all-stars going against each other. Dodgers are playing the Marlins. The Dodgers are hot. They've won nine in a row. They're now tied with the Giants in the National League West. Padres four back in third place. Walker Ferris Bueller is pitching against Trevor. Yes, we drafted him, not Derek Rogers. All stars, right? No. Walker Bueller having an unbelievable season for the Dodgers. Eight and one with a two, three or something, did not make the all star team. As a pitcher, the National League is quite deep with all star starters with starters. But Walker Bueller is not an all star. But guess who is Trevor Rogers, the rookie for the Marlins. One of only two rookies who made the all star team. Trevor Rogers, you know, we talk about him often, right? Because we drafted him. It was a crazy draft. He's ended up. He's a great pitcher now. He's having a great rookie season. I'm really happy for him. But Trevor Rogers is a perfect example of the rule where every team needs an all-star. There is not one all-star player on the Marlins. And it's not because I don't want there to be. It's because there's not. When you're a team that is the defending champion and you are still in first place, no matter your payroll, no matter your depth, and you are eight and one, and there's been sticky substances, and you're still getting guys out, and keeping your ERA down, unlike Garrett Cole, you got to be an all-star. I think it's the first time in over 10 years that the Dodgers don't have an all-star pitcher. And the reason Bueller is not an all-star is because Trevor Rogers is. And this is not to say Trevor Rogers is not almost deserving. Because he is. Almost. One-to-one, I'm putting Bueller on the team. But Rodgers is the representative. And guess what? They pitch against each other tonight. So if you know Walker Bueller, he looks young, right? He just sort of looks like he's this nice guy, easygoing. Guy's a bulldog, competitive, bitter. Not bitter in a bad way, but has a long memory. Walker Bueller wants to beat Trevor Rodgers tonight. I promise you that. The Dodgers over the Marlins in the nothing personal pick of the day for today. 92 and 67 going into that game. 
We mentioned Garrett Cole, who was named to the All-Star team, along with the Roldis Chapman. Now, I always smile because Yankees are going to be All-Stars more than other players because Yankees are the Yankees are the Yankees, and the Yankees are God's gift to MLB. The gift that keeps on giving. The host team, Colorado Rockies, have one All-Star, the pitcher Marquez. They didn't even put Trevor Story in, though there's going to be replacements over the next few days as players are injured and pitchers can't play, et cetera. So Garrett Cole was named to the All-Star team. Garrett Cole, who had over a five ERA in June since not being allowed to use sticky substances. Did you watch Cole's game on our pick of the day? His shortest start, he didn't even get through four. Garrett Cole looks like the guy in the Pirates before he got traded to the Astros. Shows some signs, but no ace, no $324 million guy, no World Series champion. Garrett Cole looks like a middle of the rotation guy. Is it possible that that is the power of spider tech? That, of course, is the real issue. Because if it's so, then there's a problem for the Yankees. So the Yankees get a role this Chapman as well. And a role this Chapman has struggled since the end of the sticky substances. He's given up runs at record pace for him. He can still throw upper 90s. He can touch low hundreds sometimes, but he's hittable because what made Chapman so amazing was not just his velocity. Take a look and watch him and you'll see a level of spin that when you're looking for spin or sitting on fastball, you get confused. You can't swing when it's 100. You can't catch up with his breaking ball. And therefore, you're not going to get a hit to say nothing of a bunch of hits. Once in a while, you'll get a home run because you sit on fastball. You get lucky. And I think that happened in the uh, um, the ALCS when he gave up the buzzer home run to Jose Altuve. I don't remember what year, but that seems to be in my mind. But Chapman has been struggling nine earned runs in his last three appearances. That is not good. People always would ask me. This is a funny question that fans have. I like this. I think I've covered this before, but it's worth mentioning again. When a player signs a contract, they get it. It's guaranteed no matter what. You get a contract and you're banged for steroids. Yeah, you're suspended for the 80 games. You don't get paid for that. But if you got four years left on your deal, you get paid those four years, even if you stop taking steroids and you suck after. Yeah, I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. Take a look at Brady Anderson or D. Gordon or players like that. I love you, D. You know I do. But come on. What about Garrett Cole? You signed for 324. All of a sudden, can't use your foreign substance and you stink. Can the Yankees somehow get rid of him and not have to pay him? <clears throat> shockingly I spent time on this issue because I was trying to get out of a contract that I signed because didn't want to pay a player who was no longer performing at the level that he was playing at when he got the contract. So there are clauses in the uniform player contract that talk about being in first class physical condition. They talk about activities you can't do. There is no clause in the contract that says if I suck, I will give you money back. If I am greater than I've been, I will ask you for more money. Those clauses don't exist. So I looked back into my legal days, reminded myself of when I was learning about fraudulent inducement to enter into a contract. And I tried to make that a cause of action. You were cheating. I didn't know your cheating, which is fraudulent, caused me, induced me to sign you to a contract. That's fraud. Fraudulent inducement to enter a contract. The remedy is you get out of the contract. Sometimes you can get back pay, back money off. Think about it in the regular world, forget sports. When you're fraudulently induced to enter into a contract, I own a company. And the company I own makes mice. I'm holding up. If you're not watching this on YouTube, please go to YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson, and just hit subscribe. Thank you. I'm holding up a mouse. 
I'm in the market to buy a company that makes mice. Heard you say mouses, Coca. I think it's mice. And I go through the company's factory and I go through the company's books. I do due diligence. I see the machine that makes the mice. It looks like mice are being made. Their books say they make mice at a rate of 100 per hour. So I buy the company based on all of that information. Buy the company, walk into the factory the day after I own the company, and I look around and I don't see any mice. It's miceless. I look at the machine and there's like one little mouse in it and it's sputtering along. Turns out they totally screwed around with the machine while I was visiting saying, hey, make it look like we make a lot of mice. But then once it comes up and once we sell, we don't make mice any longer. And I say, wait a minute. You told me you make mice. Now you don't make mice. You were fraudulent. You induced me to buy your company when you're not a mice maker. So you can't get your money back. In that case, you totally can. But when Garrett Cole uses spider tack, nope, no dice. So the Yankees have a situation. What do you do when, uh, when your team stinks? We've talked about Hal Steinbrenner, the owner, George Steinbrenner, the former owner who would have fired Boone by now, fired Cashman by now. Hal Steinbrenner saying it's the player's fault. It's not Boone. It's not Cashman. It's not the coaching staff. When your team is struggling the way the Yankees are, we would sometimes talk to the leadership of the team. We would put together a leadership council, and those are the players we would go to to talk about issues around the team. And we'd say, listen, I think we need a team meeting, but I don't think that we want to do it. I think you need to do a players only meeting. A players only meeting is when you kick out the front office, you kick out the coaching staff, you kick out the manager, you kick out the clubhouse people. You sit there with just the 26 guys in the clubhouse and whoever wants to talk gets to talk. And it often is a red ass session. I don't think that's the expression. A red ass session. It's where uh, it's when someone has the ass and uh, bare ass. Come on, Coca. Can you help me? What's the expression when you've got like a, when you're angry and you've got the ass is how I say it. And so players get up and they talk. We've got to do better. We've got to dig deep and realize that if we don't start winning games, they're going to break us up, which they're not going to do. Or we're not going to get new contracts. We're not going to get more money. We may get traded, may get released. We're going to get our good friend, Aaron Boone, fired. Brian Cashman, the only GM many of you have ever had, gone. But the problem with players only meetings, A, you never get a true report of what went on. So I would speak to players after players only meeting and I'd get five stories from five guys because they all hear something different to the extent they're even paying attention, which when you've got a team of 26 players, at least 50% are not paying attention to any team meeting, any players only meeting, any memo you send, any itinerary of a road trip you give, at least 50% are not paying attention. You have to continue to tell them what's happening when it's happening. So Aaron Judge led a players-only meeting for the Yankees before their subway series against the Mets, talking about what Hal Steinbrenner had said about how it's the players' fault. And I thought it went very well. The Yankees went on to lose two out of three to the Mets. And now what? The Yankees are basically a 500 team. And it's not early anymore. The season is halfway done. What's the Yankees record, Coke? I'm going to guess 42 and 41, something in that range. That's a record that's strikingly similar to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. For some reason, I have this view that their records are similar, if not the same. And that is a problem if you are Aaron Boone. I still tell you he is not going to get fired now. However, I stand by my prediction if the Yankees don't make the playoffs, Boone's done, Cashman's done. It's it's going to be very, very bad. So what do you want to do next, Coca? I think we got to take a break. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to review the new Steven Soderbergh movie, which I watched yesterday. And we got to talk about the place I was born. Yes, sir. We're going to talk about Milwaukee. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name is David Sampson. Thanks for being with us. It's Monday, July 5th. Not a holiday for me or for Coca or for you. 
because you got to give me 45 minutes of your time. Thank you for rating, reviewing, following. Please spread the word. Tell your friends about nothing personal. One of the things we get to do is watch a movie every day. So I don't go to theaters anymore, and I don't know why I don't. I think it's because I'm a germaphobe. I think it's because I still don't feel totally comfortable sitting indoors, but that's not the reason. The reason I don't like going to movies has been the same reason pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID. There's nothing, there is nothing, I hate olives more. There is nothing I dislike more than people talking during a movie. I'm the guy, shh, could you please be quiet? It's just the credit, it's just the previews. I'm here to watch the previews. Keep it down, please. Shh, please. It's just the pre-preview commercials. I like the pre-preview commercials. What about people who say to you in a movie, hey, I can talk now. The movie hasn't started. Shut up. Now with all the streaming services and when movies go right to HBO Max or wherever they are, first releases, original content on Netflix, wherever you are, on Paramount Plus, doesn't matter. I'm skipping theaters. I just am. So a new movie came out that I had to watch called No Sudden Move. No Sudden Move is directed by Steven Soderbergh. If you don't know that name, you should. I've got three words for you. Out of sight. Stop what you're doing in the next, I guess we got what, 14 minutes left, Coca? You got 14 minutes of a show left right now. Then go watch Out of Sight with Jennifer Lopez, George Clooney, Don Cheadle, Ving Rhames, et cetera. So Steve Soderbergh has earned the right that I will watch every single Steve Soderbergh movie. Don Cheadle is in this movie. Benicio Del Toro, how can you go wrong with those two in a movie like that? The movie is about the craziness that took place in the 50s and 60s when the four major car companies were basically colluding in order to not have to put a part in their car called a catalytic converter, and I may have gotten that wrong, but that's in my head right now, a catalytic converter that helps make less pollution. And the movie is about a new piece of technology that one of the car companies wanted to keep from the rest of the car companies, or was it something else wanting it to keep it from something else or someone else? In any case, picture a movie, a Steven Soderbergh movie, where there is double crossing going on left and right. There is bribery, there's payoffs, there's violence, there's crime, there's the mob implicated, there's the four major car companies implicated. And then there is a spoiler alert, a cameo from a guy who I would argue is famous. He's way more famous for a character he plays. He's an Oscar winner. But to me, he's hugely famous for cameos. He does these hilarious cameos. And no, I don't mean Tom Cruise in Tropic Thunder or Tom Cruise in Rock of Ages, even though that's not a cameo because he was credited. This is an uncredited cameo. Watch for it. End of the movie. No Sudden Move is quick. No Sudden Move is interesting. It's also based on a true story. The only tinge of sadness that I had watching No Sudden Move is that it was not as good as Out of Sight. And I want Soderbergh's movie to keep getting better and better. So if you're looking for a double feature, go No Sudden Move first and then Out of Sight second. No Sudden Move. Talk about no sudden move. Giannis cannot do anything sudden. What's that transition, Coca? Giannis hyperextended his knee. I want to talk a little bit about that. So basketball is now in the final stages. We're in July. This is still a COVID issue that the NBA finals are taking place in July. I'm hoping next year they get back to the regular schedule where the NBA finals are in June. But we are about to watch starting, I don't know when. Is it tomorrow, Coca? I think it starts Tuesday, the NBA Finals. The Phoenix Suns are playing the Milwaukee Bucks. You may remember when the NBA season started, I picked the Bucks 
to beat the Nuggets in the NBA Finals. I'm halfway there. I got the Bucks right. And the Bucks were favored over the Suns until Giannis got hurt. They would have been favored, but now they're underdogs because Giannis hyperextended his knee. So when I get a call from a trainer and I saw a player come up limp, there's the first thing that would always be in my head is the baseball injury that I'm most scared of uh, for from the waist down, and that is hamstring. Hamstring issues linger. If you come back too soon, they get re-hurt, and then you're out longer. It's very hard to know what's going on with your hamstring. You get a ton of treatment, but then you have to test it, and you test it at 20% capacity, then 40%, 60 80 100 Then you do starts and stops, and every time there's a running progression with a hamstring issue, you worry about a re-injury. An injury that Giannis has is called the hyperextended knee. People get upset when I practice medicine without a license, but I'm going to and tell you that when we had a player who had a hyperextended knee, or when you see other players in baseball when they hyperextend their knee, it doesn't happen too often. It's when you land wrong and your knee, it's not like your knee buckles. It's like it gets elongated and then buckles. Hyperextended is just what it sounds like. And this is not a medical term. This is me describing what it is. It's like when you stretch out a rubber band and then it never quite gets back to the way it was when it was perfect out of the bag. It's like when you pull it to put it around a big stack of papers and then it sort of looks off the next time you look at it. It's not per perfectly circular anymore. It's not as tight anymore. And everything is better, right? When it's new and like your knee, it's never been hyperextended. So it's new and it's tight and everything's good. All of a sudden it's hyperextended and you have no choice but to rest. You cannot play with a hyperextended knee. It is not smart for your future. It's not smart for your present. And in basketball, you need your knees. Like what I did there? Do you know that 10 plus 10 and 11 plus 11 are the same number? Yeah, they are. What's 10 plus 10? 20. What's 11 plus 11? 20. Two. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's a holiday Monday. Coke and I are on the phone very early in the morning. We're getting this show ready. We're putting it together for you. We're in the middle of talking about a serious like topic and Coca drops on me. Hey, do you know what 10 plus 10 is? And did you know that 10 plus 10 and 11 plus 11 are the same number? And I said, what are you talking about? One is 20 and one is 22. He said, yeah. I said, yeah, what? And then he said, 22, T-O-O. -O. And he laughed. I sort of laughed also. So did you see what I did with knee and need? Need? Giannis is not going to play in game one of the NBA Finals. My experience with hyperextended knees, it's not just a week, it's 10 days, it can even be longer. My wait to see, which is something we do, and uh, wait to see is when we say something's gonna happen and we're gonna revisit it, because sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, but either way, I want to let you know that I'm paying attention to every wait to see we've ever done. Today is episode 403 of the wait to see episodes, and I've got track of every, every one of them. Wait to see, unfortunately, for the Bucs, Giannis is going to miss at least the first two games of the NBA Finals. I am concerned he's going to miss the entire NBA Finals, and I am having flashbacks to 1999. 1999 is when the Knicks made their unexpected run as a low seed. They were either a seven or eight seed back in 99, as I recall, and they upset the Miami Heat in the first round and then made it all the way to the finals and played against the Spurs. But Patrick Ewing got hurt, and it was just Latrell Sprewell. And I still thought, oh, my God, we're going to finally get a title, but it's going to be without Patrick. And I'll be so sad, but it'll be great that he gets a ring so he can be considered better than Elijah one who had won the titles in 94 and 95, 94 being over the Knicks. But no, Ewing didn't play, and the Knicks lost. And my concern is that's going to happen. The Suns are now installed as pretty definitive favorites. The Bucs are a really good team, good enough to get past the Hawks without Giannis and with a semi-injured Trey Young. 
they're not good enough to get past the Suns. It will take Lopez and Middleton of the Bucks and Holiday to become a big three in order to have a chance. But wait to see Giannis is going to miss at least the first two games of the NBA Finals. All right, I want to end the show with a question that someone asked me, Coca. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Follow me on Twitter, David P. Samson, D-A-V-I-D-P-S-A-M-S-O-N. Get into my direct message, which are open to the public. I'm going to respond to as many as I can, look at as many as I can. But this was a good one. Question. Did the Marlins really throw at Acuna? Can you please explain what happened? Yes, I can. This weekend, there was a serious situation in Miami. It actually was in Atlanta. First pitch, bottom of the first inning, Pablo Lopez to Acuna, Ronald Acuna leading off. Acuna gets hit in his elbow armor, walks to first base. The manager of the Braves comes out to say that's horse hockey. The Marlins always throw at Acuna. You got to eject Pablo Lopez. Of course, what he's referring to is the fact that three years ago, Jose Urania, on the first pitch of a game, threw at Acuna, hit him, got thrown out of the game. The only pitcher to get thrown out after one pitch in the first inning since Jose Urania, Pablo Lopez. Same team, same player hit. The umpires get together and say, we got to eject him. We believe that there was intent to hit Acuna. We've got to stop any escalation of this situation, which is the job of the umpires. We want to make sure this doesn't turn into a beanball contest. We're going to end it now. So Lopez gets ejected. Out comes Don Maddenly, the manager. Out comes Mel Stottlemyre, the pitching coach. Everyone's ejected. They're going crazy. And the question you're asking is, did the Marlins throw at Acuna? You're goddamn right they did. That's a few good men reference. Yes, they did. Here is what you get to do when you've got a player who absolutely beats you senseless and who has a cold zone inside. In order to get out Acuna, you have to throw the ball inside. If you're afraid to throw the ball inside and you leave it over the plate or outside, Acuna will simply Acuna you. Acuna Matata. He'll crush you. So the strategy we always had and that everybody has against Acuna is to throw inside. What happens when a pitcher's trying to throw inside? Every once in a while, they're going to get hit. The difference between when Urania did it three years ago and Lopez today or yesterday or whatever day it was, right around the Urania incident, there have been a bunch of HBPs. There have been a bunch of home run pimping, a bunch of things that made it as though Urania was directed, you are going to hit him. There was nothing going on on Friday with the Marlins and the Braves. Acuna, Acuna continues to stay hot. There's no doubt. But you've got to pitch him inside. I am coming down on the side of the Marlins on this without a question. Because did they throw at him? Yeah. But they threw at him to get him off the plate. They didn't try to hit him. Throwing at a player and trying to hit the player are two different things. When someone is taking the inside of the plate and they're crowding the plate and you want to get them off the plate, you are throwing it up and in, not at the head, but you just want to brush him back. It is the only way to get Acuna out. Why would the Marlins use Pablo Lopez and go to a bullpen game against the Braves on that particular day two days ago. Plenty of times in my career, we said, hit him, hit him. Yes, you're hitting him. 
Yes, hit Acuna. Yes, hit this guy. Yes, hit that guy. But you're hitting him on the tush. You're hitting him on the numbers. But when a player crowds the plate, we also said hit that inside part of the plate and brush him off because we're trying to win games here. Umpires have to be better and no hitters. They have to be better and not think about something that happened three years ago. They've got to be better. We all got to be better. Thanks for listening to the show. It's just business. This is nothing personal.